We begin today's show in Japan, where Japan's former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been shot and killed by an assassin wielding what appeared to be a homemade gun. Abe was campaigning for a parliamentary election candidate Friday morning in the city of Nara, in central Japan, when two shots rang out. Images of the attack's aftermath show security officials tackling a man in a gray T-shirt. They later named the 41-year-old suspect as Tetsuya Yamagami, a former member of Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemned the killing as his voice cracked. We cannot accept that this violent act took place during an election, the foundation of democracy. In the strongest terms, I condemn this act. Footage from the scene of the assassination shows the assassin wielded what appears to be an improvised double-barreled gun. Japan's strict gun control laws prevent almost everyone from possessing guns. In 2021, there were 10 shooting incidents in Japan, just one gun death, while the U.S. typically records 45,000 gun deaths each year. Shinzo Abe was airlifted to a nearby hospital with injuries to his neck and heart. He was pronounced dead earlier today. He was 67 years old. Abe was Japan's longest-running prime minister when he stepped down in 2020, citing poor health. Over nearly eight years in office, Abe remained pro-nuclear, despite the 2011 Fukushima nuclear meltdown following an earthquake and tsunami. Throughout his career, Abe tried unsuccessfully to do away with Article 9 of Japan's peace constitution, which renounces war and bars Japan from using or threatening to use military force. We go now to Japan, where we're joined by Koichi Nakano. He is a professor at Sofia University in Tokyo. We last spoke to you in 2014, when we broadcast Democracy Now! from Japan. Uh, welcome back to Democracy Now! under extremely difficult circumstances. First, can you respond to the assassination of the longest-running prime minister in Japan's history, um, Shinzo Abe? Hi, I mean, um, well, of course, everybody was caught by utter surprise, and of course, we are all appalled and uh, in shock. Um, you know, the um, of course, uh, gun violence is uh, an extreme rarity in Japan in itself, but also uh, the uh, you know the fact that this took place um, against a sitting member of the parliament and the former prime minister with. Uh, a lot of influence over the um, government policy even today, and um, uh, the fact that this happened during the uh, campaign as he was making a speech in favor of a candidate of his own party uh, exposed the vulnerability of the politicians and the candidates uh, during the time of the election in particular. Uh, Mr. Abe is not an ordinary candidate. Well, he wasn't running. Uh, he was just uh, cheering for uh, another candidate uh, from his party. Uh, but of course, he was escorted by uh, a group of uh, security police, uh, which is not usually the case with the other candidates or politicians uh, in the electoral campaign. So uh, this is um, uh, something that I think we are um, still sort of trying to figure out and uh, understand uh, how this happened. Right. High officials said he had the absolute highest security. Uh, but guns are such a rarity in Japan. I mean, the picture of this gun, it looks like two pipes that are gaffered taped together. Um, and it looks like the assassin who they tackled uh, was a member of the um, maritime uh, forces of Japan in the, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Can you explain what that is? And that goes to the issue of what um, one of the reasons Prime Minister Abe was so controversial as he tried to change the peace constitution of Japan. Right. Uh, so, yes, I mean, uh, we still don't know in great details, and maybe we'll never fully understand uh, what was the motive behind the, uh, the killing. Uh, but um, uh, what we do know is that the man used to uh, serve in the Maritime Self-Defense Force, which is Japan's equivalent to the Navy, although, of course, Japan, by according to the Constitution, as Amy explained earlier on, uh, Article 9 uh, um, stipulates that Japan uh, 
from banning uh, war potential, uh, and therefore uh, it is strictly supposed to be uh, for um, individual self-defense. Um, Mr. Abe uh, has controversially lifted the ban on collective self-defense in uh, 2015, uh, and um, but of course um, the man uh, was serving in the self defense force way before that, and according to the reports, he seemed to have served for three years, uh, and he has left the self defense force long since. So uh, we still don't know whether there is any kind of meaningful connection between his experience and uh, the crime that he committed uh, today. Uh, so I think at this point it is very difficult to make the connection, uh, though of course, um, you know, maybe it is related, but we just don't know yet. Um, and the significance of what Abe was trying to do, uh, what he never succeeded in doing. Ultimately, he stepped down both times he was prime minister because of what health reasons, right? He has ulcerative colitis, some kind of um, or something like that. Uh, but right. he attempted to do this. Now, this is the U.S. written Japanese constitution after World War II, but it was, I think, with some officials in the U.S. government's attempt also supporting Abe in removing that from the Constitution. Right. And, um, in fact, Mr. Abe tried to sort of overcome what he saw as the uh, constraint, uh, unreasonable constraint, in his view, of uh, Article 9 on Japan's self-defense capabilities uh, by taking two different routes. Uh, one was, of course, to seek to formally revise the Constitution, which he never got around to do. And, in fact, it is somewhat ironic that uh, he was at the heart of the LDP ruling party's campaign to try to sort of secure a two-third majority uh, in this upper house election so that the um, parties in favor of revising Article 9 would have enough seats to instigate a national referendum to that effect. And a central sort of pillar of the proposal was to uh, include the term self-defense force into Article 9, uh, as Mr. Abe claimed that in the absence of such stipulation, self-defense force was suffering from the lack of legitimacy. Uh, an argument that um, uh, many people in Japan were not quite convinced, because a lot of people in Japan uh, accept the existence of a, a self-defense force, as long as it's within the boundaries of Article 9, uh, concentrating on narrow uh, individual self-defense and spending most of the time uh, in efforts to uh, rebuild and uh, rescue uh, at the time of disasters. Um, and uh, But having failed to do that, Mr. Abe has, even more controversially, uh, has taken the shortcut and uh, instead of formally revising Article 9, he has resorted to uh, government offering a reinterpretation of the same text of the article. And uh, so this happened in um, July 2014, uh, exactly around the time when Amy uh, had a chance to visit Tokyo uh, at the time, uh, well, and Japan at the time, and uh, subsequently also uh, passing legislation uh, that uh, enabled the government to um, exercise collective self-defense. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, I guess he left uh, somewhat frustrated, uh, but at the same time, uh, he has um, um, he has pushed through uh, a fundamental change in Japanese national uh, security posture of the po called uh, post war. You know, we're showing images of um, of Prime Minister Abe with President Obama. Um, he stood with President Obama at Hiroshima. President Obama, the first American president to go to Hiroshima, um, the U.S. dropping the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they stood together at Pearl Harbor. That's right. That's right. And, uh, well, in terms of gun violence, even though it is a rarity, uh, in fact, uh, the um, mayor of the city of Nagasaki, well, two different mayors of the city of Nagasaki, have been uh, shot, um, and one died, uh, uh, consequently, uh, out of, um, of, a, of a, actually a gun shooting. And um, so in that sense, you know, it's a rarity, but it's not entirely unheard of. 
and uh, it usually is committed a crime that is committed uh, by the right wing or by yakuza mobsters. Uh, when we were in Tokyo broadcasting from there, I remember the major protests around nuclear power because of the Fukushima nuclear meltdown. Uh, Abe was well known at the time. He was prime minister for supporting nuclear power. Uh, horrifically ironic, uh, the head doctor um, at NADA, uh, where he was brought at the Medical University Hospital, his name is Dr. Fukushima. But the significance of Abe's pro-nuclear stance. Right. So, um, I guess one of the missions that uh, Abe uh, embraced was to try to push back uh, nuclear power generation uh, on its track after he um, took power back from the uh, Democratic Party of Japan government uh, between 2009 and 2012, uh, which uh, happened at the time of the uh, Fukushima disaster. And uh, while the party that was in government at the time has since uh, tried to steer away from Japan from nuclear power generation, uh, the ruling—today's ruling LDP uh, from Abe's uh, time onward uh, have made significant efforts to uh, restart nuclear power plants or uh, try to sort of regain uh, legitimacy to nuclear power, uh, but, um, well, with only very limited degree of success so far. Uh, Professor Nakano, uh, you wrote a piece um, uh, that was headlined, The Leader Who Was Trump Before Trump. I mean, this was a few years ago. It was an op-ed piece in The New York Times. Explain. Right. So this was actually uh, kind of a intended praise by Steve Bannon uh, that Mr. Abe was Trump before Trump. And, uh, well, uh, Bannon is not the only person to take that view either. Uh, Mr. Abe returned to power in December 2012, campaigning uh, on the slogan, uh, Taking Back Japan, uh, which finds, of course, later resonation with Make America Great Again, slogan of Mr. Trump. And um, uh, the two famously got along, or Mr. Abe went a long way to please uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and um, I, I guess he really prioritized uh, the uh, cordial relationship uh, between uh, him and the president of the U.S., be it Obama or Trump, uh, so that uh, Japan can strengthen its alliance with the United States uh, under the name of the rule of law and the defense of the liberal order worldwide. It is ironic that in an attempt to do so, as I mentioned before, uh, he ignored the constitutional uh, constraints and reinterpreted the Article 9 to fit his purposes. And so, uh, even though he's regarded sometimes by the West and by the American opinion leaders quite often that he's the champion of the liberal democratic world uh, and a great statesman, domestically he's been a much more controversial figure, uh, as divisive as Mr. Trump in many ways. Uh, and um, the liberal left has been looking at him as the person who really put the uh, endangered uh, liberal democracy as we know it today in terms of suppressing press freedom, in, uh, in terms of press, uh, suppressing academic freedom, and also um, ignoring the constitutional rules and also uh, often uh, stepping away from accountability in the national diet, which is our parliament. Finally, the implications of Abe's assassination. Um, are you concerned that this will push Japan to the right? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, that would be uh, something that I think many of us on the liberal left of the political spectrum are worried about at this moment. Um, the, um, of course, you know, this has been an attack. This is an attack on democracy, not so much because Mr. Abe was a champion of democracy in Japan uh, in, in itself, but rather because this is uh, this uh, struck at the heart uh, of uh, the democratic process when the election campaign was at its uh, fullest operation. Uh, and uh, the voting day is only uh, is there are only one day left. It's going to be on Sunday. So tomorrow, uh, Saturday would be the last day uh, of campaigning. 
but uh, now the television is uh, airing continuously uh, rather psychophantic tributes to Mr. Abe, uh, ignoring the fact that he was rather a controversial figure. And I guess it's hard to sort of be critical of him openly uh, at a time like this when he died a tragic death. But uh, even though the television has been rather muted until today, uh, because they've been sort of trying to keep the balance or trying to sort of not offend the government by too aggressively reporting on the past policy failures and scandals, uh, now the uh, media looks like it's almost hijacked by uh, LDP government's record in a very uh, analyzed or not so much analyzed in a positive way. So uh, this would quite possibly lead to a landslide victory by the ruling LDP and its allies on Sunday, uh, which might, in fact, hand them a, a sort of a, you know, a blank check uh, that uh, they will be able to utilize for the next years to come.